You're listening to the Groundbreaking Podcast from the Global Ag Tech Initiative. The Global Ag Tech Initiative is the catalyst for connecting, engaging, and fostering dialogue in global food production with technology as the foundation for driving innovation and solutions. The Groundbreaking Podcast brings forth voices across the industry to discuss trends, best practices, and innovative ideas driving agriculture forward in a rapidly changing world. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Groundbreaking Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tunstall, co-chair of the Global Ag Tech Initiative. And today I'm here with Sumer Johal, CEO of Semios. Welcome, Sumer. Thanks, Heather. Very nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So for those who have listened to this podcast, uh, we've talked a little bit about AI and how it can impact on farm operations. But today we're going to approach the topic from a slightly different angle, focusing on how advisors and retailers specifically can leverage AI. But before we dive in, Sumer, let's get to know a little bit about you. Can you tell us a bit about your career and about Semios for those who aren't familiar with the organization? Sure, happy to. Um, so my uh, journey really started in uh, northern India in a place called Punjab, which is a northern Indian state. I come from a family of farmers and farming family uh, going back several generations and passionate about you know farming and agriculture. So I grew up in India. I came to the U.S. when I was a teenager. I did my undergraduate and graduate work in electrical engineering and computer science from uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And then uh, after paying my dues, as they say, at MIT, I have spent the last uh, 25 years in tech. First dozen years or so have been in really different industries with the common theme of data analytics, where really I used data and, and, and analytics to create positive efficiency change in various industries, semiconductors and financial services, consumer retail and the like. And then the last dozen years or so, a little over a dozen years, almost 15 years now, I've been focused on the agri ecosystems. I started and built and grow companies and biofuels and different technology bases in affecting uh, rural and, and agricultural ecosystems and really have a passion for how technology in general can, can really transform the status quo in what is an incredible ecosystem of stakeholders that make our food possible. So that's been my journey. And I'm really driven by purpose and passion. More than half of the labor force of the world is employed in agriculture. It's an existential need that we all, if you eat, if you're fortunate enough to get a meal, you know, that meal was originated by a farmer or brewer somewhere. And the whole world works together in an incredible choreography to make that food happen on everybody's plate. Uh, And when we were growing up as kids, that was our dinner conversation. You know, and I remember very distinctly, and that's really still to this day, the reason why I pursue this passion is because it's so important to elevate the journey and the the life's work of the world's farmers and growers who make our food possible. We used to talk about that on our dining table every day, and I'm sure farmers to this day talk about this, and, and that's really been the sort of purpose behind it. What's also really exciting is that, you know, the technology ecosystem from the birth of the internet others that I saw at MIT and and after MIT been you know part of many indus- industries kind of transformation in the digital era have really so much promise for improving those lives and livelihoods and the effort and profits in a sustainable both economically and environmentally sustainable way for the agriculture community that gives me great pleasure and really a lot of energy to sort of uh, focus that attention towards the world's farmers and that's kind of why I do what I do, and I have been for some time. My journey at Semios is relatively recently. I just joined about nine months ago. I had been, you know, focused on ag tech for the last decade or so. I've done work in open source and startups, et cetera, and had been tracking Semios as one of those companies that has some very unique data sets that from the company's inception has been focused on providing really incredible foresight driven through data for farmers and growers and the kinds of work that Semios has done in both pest and disease management, but also in water, also in farm management, information systems and capturing records and clients all around is a incredibly unique set of data sets that have been accomplished over the last, let's say, dozen years that Semios has been around. 
So I've been tracking Semios, and when the opportunity came, I, I was delighted to uh, explore it and found that there was a very nice fit between my passion and purpose for my life and my journey and, and Semios's journey. So Semios is very well positioned to be the global leader, category leader for global agriculture district transformation. We look at that not only as what we can do to enable our stakeholders, growers, farmers, advisors, and such, make agriculture happen more efficiently, more profitably, more sustainably, but also what we can do to elevate and enable other actors, other uh, startups, other large companies, others, others who are trying to innovate. How can we elevate their journey as well? And so it's really been a fantastic coming together of, of minds at Samios and I'm really delighted to be leading it at the state of this journey. I, I really love how you beautifully put that this is a choreographed industry and everybody is working together and, and what you just spoke to, the uh, the efforts that Semios puts into it and, and all of the actors and all of the players in the industry working together toward a more sustainable food production. That's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And so as we get started, let's set the stage a little bit, right, with our first question. From your perspective, Sumer, what are some of the most consequential precision agriculture technologies that have come on market in the past few years? Yeah, it's a, I guess it depends really on how you measure few, but I'll say that in the last sort of 100 years, if you will, the Industrial Revolution, you know, if you sort of scope out a bit more from a technology perspective, we are still, we still have to make food the way we made 100 years ago, but there are some very important technologies that have provided an incredible boost in efficiency for uh, food and agriculture globally. Uh, and I'll just sort of rank some of them out, and I'm, I'm sure I'm missing some others. But the, from my perspective as a technologist with a deep passion and family passion in agriculture, I would say the number one is GPS. I think the global positioning satellite system enables so much of what we do in agriculture today, automation, that we sometimes take it for granted. And you know, it wasn't very long ago when GPS was not there, and we were sort of estimating what we have to do with it. Those kinds of things have really transformed uh, agriculture as we know it. The second would be, I think, advances in genetics. I think that genetics advances and those, you know, all of these have unintended consequences, which we need to be very careful and guarded about. And but genetics have allowed us to kind of really push out the Malthusian trap that we were predicting would happen in the 1800s where we'd run out of food. And so in the 1900s, we actually through the industrial revolution and the genetics revolution, was able to were able to really bring out and push out that time frame for the Malthus trap, and I think that's been a, a big big success in terms of creating food. I think uh, IoT is another one where we we don't think about IoT in, in, the, in a clear way in, in agriculture sometimes, but we think of like variable spray devices or variable rate applicators, you know, variable harvesting, other things that require IoT, which is sort of edge computing. And that by itself, but also in conjunction with GPS, has really been an incredible ability to sort of do, actually do actions or actuate devices at the point of service at scale. I mean, this is happening now at billions of acres globally. But also say remote sensing, you know, satellites and drones in particular, but also other types of remote sensing around weather, um, monitoring, et cetera, have been incredibly useful, you know, weather and the way that crops and pests respond to weather. It can all be observed, and that observability through satellites, drones, as well as through weather stations has been incredibly useful, productive, a big step change, and a long way to go, but still a huge step change in terms of technology where we understand the behavior uh, in, in light of an increasingly uncertain you know, climate and, and weather patterns that we see in, in all over the world. Uh, and of course, the latest uh, shiny object on the hill is AI, and I think that AI has just been around for a long time. People think of AI as the most recent uh, avatar, which is the Gen AI piece. But uh, data analytics, AI, I would say generally math, has been around for a long time. And so I think the application of AI as we collect more data and use that to inform our decisions uh, has been phenomenal. And it's not just the Gen AI piece. I think, you know, Semios, for example, has been using AI for over seven years. And we invented some of the early pest detection techniques by taking pictures and training them on machine learning algorithms. And so those kind of advances have really changed the face of our efficiency, but also many, many others. And so I think those are some of the short list of things that I would say have been groundbreaking technologies that have impacted agriculture in a very meaningful way. 
Absolutely. And when we're talking about these different technological advancements, even over the past hundred years, and then more recently in the past, maybe three to five years or so, how would you say they've affected the roles that advisors and retailers specifically have typically played in the industry? Yeah, it's a very important question, which often gets not asked and not answered. And I think that I appreciate you're asking the question. You know, for advisors, you know, this is starting with, uh, you know, agriculture extension advisors, for example. I remember when I was a kid, we had agriculture extension advisors in our village, and they would come in and basically help my dad and my grandfather, you know, make decisions. So, you know, advisors have really transformed and have changed that their their role has changed. And I think they've gone from, you know, knowledge bearers, if you will, to, to trust and responsibility bearers. The knowledge is increasingly ubiquitously available. You know, you have more data and access to data than ever before, and everybody has access to that. But right. sort of like, who do you trust to get that data from? And I think who has that personal relationship with you, for better or for worse, who, you know, and, and mostly for the better, where you can kind of, you know, really trust that person because you're seeing them every day, you know them, it's a human to human contact. I think that the transition has been more from knowledge bearing to trust bearing. You can find the knowledge and you say, well, you know, I've heard about these five things. What do you think is real? And, and the advisors can help guide the, the stakeholders to, to the right direction, not only because they have advanced degrees and often cases, the case in their PhDs and such in their discipline, but they've really seen, they can, they have the agency to separate the, the wheat from the chaff, if you will. That is a big, big shift and one that I would advocate advisors are leaning in. Uh, some more than others towards taking on. And I I think that's a big transition. I think the, uh, you know, and you see the Farm Bureau's role, for example, change in that way over the, mm -hmm. over the years in in the U.S. as another source of advice and, and convening for new ideas just in the United States. You know, if you look at retailers there, it's a little bit more nuanced because I think at the, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, kind of the agricultural green revolution, retailers were really the you know, the e-commerce wasn't there and, and supply chains weren't very effective. So retailers were really the place where farmers could go and you couldn't really only find your seeds or inputs or what have you from those retailers. And now those commodities are ubiquitous. And so retailers are really differentiating themselves as service providers. And I think that the retailers that add that level of service on top of what is otherwise increasingly commoditized are the ones that are winning and, and are serving their clients. And their clients are, again, looking at them as their relationship uh, connector. And the ones that are not are going to be you know, increasingly obsolete. And I think that that's really where that transition is happening. For retailers. Excellent points. And when we're talking a little bit about uh, these advisors and retailers as trust points, right? Is there any way or how does AI technology assist with that and assist with their interactions with farmers on a human to human level? Yeah, you know, we're at a very exciting and yet very early stages. The technology has become now, I would say, generally available for AI to be much more conversational. But if you go to Chat GPT and start asking about agronomic advice, you'll get some very generalized things which are not really specific to a field or to a crop or to a past, I mean, not really that useful. And okay. but 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 I think that what what belies what what is sort of sometimes lost is that there's a, a whole undercurrent of, of companies and technologies. Uh, many of the semios is actually in, in, uh, creating and 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 bringing in, but also others that are going to change that for the positive in the in the in the near future. And I think that as those technologies evolve advisors and retailers uh, will be increasingly able to become those trust bearers and those differentiated service providers because they're not going to have to deal with the commodity of sifting through huge amounts of data for the sake of sifting through there. A lot of grunt work is going to be taken out of advice so that advice can be much more precise. It can be much more time efficient. It can be much more, hey, you know, this is nonsense. This is not attributable. This is This is what's good because the AI is going to be able to do a lot of the sifting for the advisor, but the ultimate responsibility and ultimate delegated kind of authority of the of the uh, advisor is going to be to be able to sift that. And that responsibility is not going to change. So as that transition to knowledge bearing is, you know, the grunt work is taken away by AI, the elevation, if you will, of that kind of trust bearing party 
and 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 service bearing party is going to get elevated. And I think that is where AI will provide a great set of tools. And we're at Semios are dedicated in that focus. That's our our kind of theory of change. And so we think that that would be a tr tremendous benefit, much like an x-ray machine or an MRI is to a, a physician. When you go to a physician, they're still the ones you go to, but they use MRI machines and AI increasingly to kind of help them be more accurate, more precise, able to do much more complex things with lower risk. I think advisors and regionals are no different. There's you know, service providers and trust bearers, and they'll be able to do their jobs much more time efficiently and much better over time with AI. Wonderful. And so we're talking a little bit more about, you know, data backed recommendations, right? And you've got the enhanced decision making coming from that. What other types of interactions and what other types of advice are retailers and advisors able to provide through the use of AI? Well, what's really interesting is that there's no limit to this because the AI is now conversational as well as analytical. So, you know, the yeah. AI can, you know, in the last kind of, let's say, 10 plus years of machine learning and, and evolution of cloud computing with machine learning has allowed the AI to be much more quantitative. And now with the conversational piece on top, it has the underpinnings as a ubiquitous tool, albeit still some ways to go to make it useful for agriculture. But once that's there, and that's very much along the path of many companies, including Semios, I think that bad advisors and retailers will be able to kind of query this or any number of things. So from optimizing labor, you know, the big issues with agriculture in the global north are labor costs, compliance costs, input costs, et cetera. And so advisors being able to give precise decisions on recommendations on what to do for various areas, I think are going to be so much more precise because they'll be able to sift through so much more information. And I think that's the game change is that there's no limit whether it's how to apply water differently or when to harvest or what seeds to apply, what seeds to grow on this particular soil. Or I think even new things like how to make your land more profitable for, for carbon markets, for example, or insurance for uh, parametric insurance companies or to get a land loan or to get you know any number of use cases. And the advisors I'm thinking about aren't just pest advisors or crop advisors. They could be financial advisors. They could be other types of advisors that are helping the, the key stakeholder, the farmer, the grower, just make better decisions and keep more money in their pocket, make food more healthy and sustainable for the growing population. And I think do that work with, you know, much more ease than they are doing today. I mean, it's just really difficult today. Right. So taking out a whole lot of that manual aspect of what their workload is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, mean, I, I sometimes jokingly call it the Roomba effect, you know, like, you know, you want to act in money, right? <laughs> It's a perfect <laughs> example of what AI can help do. It's not perfect, but it does the job, right? And, right. and so I think, you know, if you can use AI to take out some of the mundane, just time intensive stuff that you have to do, and then still be there to kind of verify, validate, and check because you still owe the responsibility to the, to the grower. I think the advisors will be that much more empowered and that much more able to use their time to grow their business, to make better service, have higher quality of service, and, you know, the ones that are going to embrace it will take business away from the ones that don't. Absolutely. So you just touched on that really important point there. They're, they're enabling them to be a better value to their clients themselves, to the farmer, to the grower, but it's also helping their own business. It's given them that time back. It's given them the opportunity to focus on growing and, and expanding their business. So sort of a twofold benefit there for, for advisors and retailers. Absolutely. I mean, we've seen this before with sensors, technology sensors and others that have helped provide more information and insight. And, you know, uh, these are all tools and ultimately the stakeholders that can use those tools uh, will be better off than the ones that don't. So let's dig into a little bit more specifics here. What are some of the opportunities that AI and other digital tools present to growers in their day-to-day -day production and their processes that they have in place? Yeah, I mean, this is a dizzying array of things that growers mm -hmm. have to do. You know, like uh, I used to remember my grandfather used to say that farmers always looking up or looking down, no time to look sideways, you know, and uh, <laughs> that's perfect. And, and that's really, it's so telling that, that that saying is so telling. I love that saying because looking sideways is all the things that are happening, you know, where 
you have so much stuff going on, you know, in, in a grower's life. You sit in their office or walk their fields with them. You know, you realize like hundreds of decisions are being made with dozens of stakeholders on a daily basis. And it's such a hyper-connected constellation of actors that are constantly in this choreography. Farming and agriculture is not a, it's a highly collaborative activity. And so I think AI is going to affect all of the things that, you know, it's not about which one, it's about sort of which one's first and, and sort of the how and, and the nuance and details. But everything from, you know, plan, planning or even owning, expanding your farm, owning your balance sheet and your farm to generational you know, changes between older farmers to younger to more diverse changes in crop types and global geopolitical shifts that are happening. There's so much happening in food and agriculture that every aspect of everything that a farmer does in the very near future is going to be, you know, within 10 years, it's going to be affected by AI and all kinds of technologies. And the challenge is the farmers, they have to focus on farming. And and what they what technology has to do is to make it easier and a lot more ubiquitous for the farmers to make choices using technology. It has to be really, really simple and easy to use while being very complex and able to deal with complexity in the back in the back end. So the front end of farmers has to have and need a tool that's really simple to use and they can switch from one vendor to another. Today, you know, if they've got ten vendors, they've got ten platforms. And Right. Nothing talks to everything. And it's just, there's, it's a lot of pain in terms of adoption. So I think those pain points have to come down. The friction has to come down when and as that comes down. And it absolutely will and already happening. The ROI for farmers is going to be better and better. And as that ROI increases, you know, with everything else, every other industry, we see this and agriculture is different, but not that different in the sense that people will slowly start to adopt these technologies. And so I, you know, I think that right now people think of advisory and agronomy as the thing that certainly it's sending us to focus on that, but everything from managing your, your farm, real estate wise land, or whether it's animals, you know, everything from uh, compliance to multiple agencies. I mean, right now there are regulatory areas coming in at the EU that are creating regulatory compliance needs from farmers of eight different commodities, including coffee, for the whole world. If you want to import into the EU, you have to comply with this or that or the other. And that's just the EU. You start looking at many other places. I mean, so coffee farmers, you know, taking, you know, selling their coffee to EU, North America, Asia, they've got a you know, comply with a dozen different regulations, which are all different. How are they going to do that, right? Uh, we're building those tools, and I think the industry has to build those tools to kind of allow that experience to be, you know, something that they can work with their advisors with and, and have trust and, and have longevity to sort of create simple, easy ways to manage that. And that's only growing. It's not going to come down. So that regulatory focus, that sort of, growth focus is only going to happen more and more. So farmers really need to get these, you know, technology tools. And I think that it's both on farmers and growers ecosystem to be more willing and adopting and open to those changes. They are. I mean, I think really the slow slow adoption is because of the pain and friction. That's where tech has to get their act together. Sure. And yeah. we have to make sure that that those those transition points are easier. We have to be much more collaborative in the ag tech ecosystem, which we are not currently at where we need to be. So that's where I see things happening. If short answer would be to a very long pre preamble is that everything and anything is going to be affected. Well, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> it is one of those things that can touch every aspect of the industry. And we're hearing that quite often. Uh, so, you know, speaking specifically to the advisors and the retailers, Say they are on board, they're ready to go. They would love to be involved in this conversation with their clients on how to better integrate AI. From a practical standpoint, what advice do you have for them if they're looking to to be that trust point for the growers and the farmers? Yeah, I mean, look, there's a huge amount of opportunity in front of us. I mean, globally, $250 billion of food is destroyed by pest and disease alone, right? So advisors can make a big dent in that. Seventy percent of global fresh water is used in, you know, in our agriculture. A lot of it is irrigation. Advisors can make a big dent in that, right? Uh, whether and 
big weather changes are affecting farmers. You know, advisors can give better foresight and better you know tactics on how to manage things and how to turn on frost frost fans and things like that when that happens. So there's lots and lots of opportunity. I think there's I would say three core things that I would advocate for kind of um, you know um, suggest that advisors and retailers be open to. I think first in this sort of era of technology, if you will, first would be open to collaboration. You know, I think that as a mindset, that's a mindset that is going to shift and the people who will shift that will be the winners. Agriculture is very collaborative. Of course, it's competitive like everything else, but the collaboration around what makes sense, like for example, pest and disease. I think we're actually at SEMIUS creating ways in which, you know, even our customers who are, even folks who are not our customers can actually collaborate with our customers. And so being able to uh, collaborate on pest and disease as an example is a very, is one example of ways to collaborate because when a pest happens in field, it doesn't care that this field belongs to this farmer or that, right? It just, right. it's a pest. It's just going to go after a crop. It doesn't care about crop boundaries. It doesn't care about anything. And so it's, it's in our best interest to actually collaborate at that, at that time. And I think that that's just one example of kind of exogenous risks that come into agriculture that we should all be working together. So I think the first one would be open to collaboration. Many of the advisors uh, need to do that. I think the second would be that be open to challenge the status quo. And the subtext there is, or your competitor will, right? So I think the status quo is sort of like how we used to do farming and how we're going to be doing farming has to evolve and has been evolving, actually. But but that evolution never stops. It's the change never stops. That's the only thing that's constant. And so essentially being open to challenge the status quo, not like this is how we did it last year or two years ago. That's how we're going to do it this year. You know, how come we're doing 20% more or less this year than last year? Being able to challenge the status quo is extremely important. And whether that status quo is self-implemented or implemented by a retailer or a tech company or whatever, it doesn't matter. I think that ultimately change is happening so fast and so much that being willing to open to challenge the status quo with a skeptical eye is something that I think advisors should embrace. And last but not least thing I would say is that be aware of the data, right? Ultimately, we should we should pay heed to garbage in, garbage out. If it's garbage that's basically curing the advice, then the advice is only going to be as good as the input, no matter how much AI you throw at it. So I think the the question that I would say advisors and retailers should ask is if somebody is providing recommendations, if they're providing recommendations, you know, is there data to back that recommendation, right? Being data informed is a good thing. It's based right. on fact, you know, ultimately math wins every time. So I think, uh, you know, those would be the three uh, things I would suggest. Excellent. And uh, for our listeners, where can we go for more information from Semios? What's your website? Well, there's our website is uh, has tons of information. Definitely go visit our website at uh, semios.com. We have a huge field presence in California and Washington. Uh, we have white trucks while, you know, r- driving around. So if you see a Semios truck, flag us down and be happy to talk to you. Uh, we're also going to be doing massive amount of customer engagement across the board in the next few months as we get ready for the next uh, season uh, in California and Washington, also in Australia and, and Europe, where we have a very big presence. And so when we do reach out or, you know, social media uh, to your neighborhood, you know, pickup truck, if you will, or, or through our website, uh, all those channels are carefully monitored by our field staff and from our marketing folks. And we will absolutely be very keen to hear feedback and, and requests from customers, advisors, partners, collaborators, even skeptics, and, and we welcome those. And so really appreciate that feedback. Wonderful. Sumer, thank you so much for taking the time today to share your expertise and speak with us on the Groundbreaking Podcast. Um, anything else that you would like to share with our listeners today? Well, thank you for having me, Heather. I would just say that I'm incredibly excited, and I hope you and your listeners are as well. The world of food and agriculture is extremely important. And I really appreciate all the listeners and, and all the my fellow warriors in ag tech who are basically putting in day in, day out to make sure our farmers succeed. Our farmers and growers all around the world uh, need all the help that they can get. And I really appreciate the work that everybody in that ecosystem is doing. Thank you so much for having me. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Samir. And for everybody else, our groundbreaking podcast will be back again next month. Uh, So stay tuned for our latest edition. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Groundbreaking Podcast from the Global Ag Tech Initiative. You can subscribe to our podcast at globalagtechinitiative.com by clicking on the podcast tab in the menu or by subscribing to our channel on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to the Global Ag Tech Initiative's weekly e-newsletter, The Signal, for all things ag tech. Visit globalagtechinitiative.com and click on the Signal Subscribe button on the right-hand side of the home page. Of course, you can also find us on LinkedIn. Just search for Global Ag Tech Initiative. To get even more in tune with the global ag tech space and be active in its advancement, consider joining the Global Ag Tech Alliance. More information on how to join the Alliance is available on globalagtechinitiative.com. The Global Ag Tech Initiative and the Groundbreaking Podcast are produced by Meister Media Worldwide. I'm Heather Tunstall, co-chair for the Global Ag Tech Initiative. Thank you for joining us today.